welcome to Schoolinary, the online cooking school that transforms people and connects cultures. You will learn with the best chefs in the industry, and you will discover the broadest online catalog of topics related to gastronomy. We publish new courses every week. In our podcast, we have coffee with a chef every week. Each of them will tell us about their experience and their vision for the culinary world to help you better understand this exciting industry. Come on, join us for coffee. Today, we are pleased to have Chris Harvey join us for coffee. Chris is a professional pastry chef, chocolatier, confectioner, and author based in Southern California. In 2017, he was named top pastry chef in America. In addition to developing his own chocolate brands, he currently travels around the world teaching the techniques and expertise of his craft to eager students at sold out venues. Hi, Chris. Welcome and thanks very much for joining us for coffee. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Great to be here. So before we begin, a question we ask all our guests is, are you a coffee drinker? Oh, absolutely. I'm a coffee drinker. And and that's always the hardest thing about traveling is uh, not waking up with my beloved coffee and special coffee maker. I was just in Buffalo, New York, teaching a three-day master class to uh, a group of students. And um, and uh, I got in late last night due to plane delays. And But uh, before I got on the plane and in my connecting city, I asked uh, my wife to set the coffee maker up for us because we have one of those Amazon plugs on it, and there's nothing more enjoyable than uh, having the machine turn on while you're still in bed uh, on a voice command, and then when it's finished, uh, walking over and grabbing it, and um, it's, 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 it's the best start of my day. That's how I start my day every day, and it's never the same going on the road, um, drinking hotel coffee or that sort of thing, because you, you kind of get used to what you want, but um, I have to make it happen somehow, but it's always good to be home to wake up with my coffee. Oh, that sounds really nice, actually. How do you take your coffee? Uh, soy creamer and a little bit of raw sugar. And I, I do have the world's best um, coffee maker. It's called the Chemex Automatic. So it's a it's a modern version of the classic Chemex design that's been around forever. And it'll, it'll kind of pre-season the grounds and then slowly brew it. And it makes the best cup of coffee I, I've ever had. So I, 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 I like it so much I've given this as expensive as it is, I've given it as gifts to people because it's just so good. Nice. So if you would please tell us in your own words, who are you, uh, where you're from, and that's so that our listeners have a chance to get to know you a little bit better. Well, I'm a, I'm a 35-year pastry chef. I come from a family of chefs. Uh, my brother, Mark, was a chef. Um, he joined uh, the culinary career in the uh, mid to late 70s when he was still in high school. He was doing a vocational tech uh, education for culinary when he was in high school. And then he went on to the Culinary Institute of America in Hyde Park, New York, uh, graduated, I believe, in 1981, and then had a very, very long career, uh, including one that took him overseas to Australia, where he's been since 1985. Um, he was a culinary educator for many years. He's since retired from that, and he's moved on to, be, to being a pastor. And to, but after, you know, 45 years of, of cooking and, and successfully uh, grooming culinary students in competition um, and, and running hotels, restaurants, private clubs, that sort of thing. And then my brother, Tom, uh, who's about a year and a half older than me, uh, he went to culinary school, same thing, Culinary Institute of America in 1989, graduated in 91. Uh, became, he became chef of, um, of the United States Senate in Washington, DC. And then after that, he moved to Florida where he opened uh, and ran a restaurant for 13 years in Sarasota. I think he had two restaurants, actually. And then um, after closing those two down uh, before the pandemic, uh, he's been working, um, kind of morphing as a food service manager in a very, very large, busy hotel, uh, working for the doctors and doing all the catering and that sort of thing, and directing the chefs um, and, and the hiring and all that process. And then, um, so so finally, uh, I caught the culinary bug too. Well, we used to grow up watching Julia Child on TV, and she was very inspirational. And then I watched Great Chefs of the West, which was a documentary program on Discovery Channel uh, back in the 1980s and early 90s, and um, just kind of caught the bug. And uh, without much experience, got hired by a really great chef, and he taught me that I think the very first thing I learned to make was creme brulee. 
and uh, and and I did uh, a little bit of savory cooking for a couple of years before I switched totally into pastry, um, and found a great mentor in uh, Solvan Gaez, uh, and who is now in Barcelona, by the way. He's been in Barcelona forever, but this was at the Ritz Carlton, Washington D.C. And moved out west, and I've been on the west coast uh, since uh, the mid '90s, maybe since 1994-1995. I've been. Uh, on the West Coast, with a couple years uh, exception, I was in Chicago on a two-year contract to work for Hyatt. But I love being in Los Angeles. Uh, I I worked for Jose Andres, uh, the great Spanish pastry chef, for five years uh, in Beverly Hills, and I got to go to Spain with him and and uh, uh, developed a great team, uh, developed myself to make myself a better chef. And I really was there uh, after traveling to France several years ago realizing that you know i was pretty good at certain things i was better uh, than i thought at other things you know comparing myself to other chefs um in in around the world after tasting their food in paris um but i thought you know i really need to get better at chocolate and after tasting patrick roger's chocolates and Henri larue's chocolates and pierre marcolini's chocolates i thought i really really and jean paul heaven i cannot forget jean paul heaven i really need to get better at chocolate and that really uh, set me on fire, whereas I became obsessed with getting better at chocolate. Well, now you bring up a, a good question uh, that you've trained and worked with some of the most skilled pastry chefs in the world. Uh, so how have they influenced your approach to your craft? Well, it, it's it's mostly uh, a, a, a check-in on my uh, ego and uh, ambition. You know, you always want to be the biggest, the best, and the greatest. But I think one of the things that they taught me the most was having a restraint. And that's the thing I respect most about European chefs is that they have a great deal of restraint and they can get away with doing very, very simple things that are just made exquisitely. And that is something I constantly have to remind uh, myself and my team. Um, you know, when you look around and you see flashy things on the Internet, you still have to remain true to yourself. So you can't be something that you're not. And I think that's that's what makes certain um, business empires so successful is that they can still remain fresh, but remain true to who they are without being ridiculous and just kind of going off into different directions. You know, I mean, in, in the most simple forms or the most simple way that I can explain it, McDonald's is always going to be about burgers and french fries, no matter what other innovations around that come out of them. And I, I've always thought about, you know, how they do it um, and and can become successful. And um, obviously it's a whole different genre of, of cooking, but it just goes to show you how important it is to maintain yourself as a brand. And every chef needs to see themselves as a brand because you never know when that opportunity comes that someone will give you the dollar amounts that you need to make your dreams come true and hopefully you can take those dollars and, and really create your own empire with it, remaining true to yourself, uh, making your investors happy, uh, providing um, a great product for your guests. So in your Instagram account, in addition to chocolatier and author, you have the title of Dragificateur, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Yeah, can enough. you explain yeah. what that is? Yeah, it's the one who specializes in making dragés. And uh, it, you know, people always want, want to ask me around the world, can you teach a dragé course? Well, it's pretty boring because you have to watch uh, a center like a nut or a dried fruit or a cereal uh, um, go around and around in a, in a, in a pan, you know, um, um, a, a dragé pan. Uh, you know, so dragés are just chocolate-covered almonds, chocolate-covered hazelnuts, uh, coated fruits, um, any uh, coated cereals that you layer slowly uh, on uh, with chocolate or sugar solutions and then you polish and shine them uh, so they look very um, appealing when they go up for sale. Uh, but I learned how to do it several years ago. And, and, you know, I always tell people there's rules, but there's no rules when it comes to dragé making. Um, it is rather, uh, it can be rather labor intensive. Uh, that's why I like to keep the food cost down on it. And I tend to uh, coat uh, cereals and, and dried fruits. Uh, and chocolate more than say nuts because it can be a little expensive, much more expensive uh, coating nuts and dragés. But I, I fell in love with this company out of France several years ago called De Medici, and they do all these beautiful, very flat almonds and in, in a sugar solution. 
They come in these beautiful pastel colors or silver or gold. And they're just incredible. And um, I, I just thought there was so much mystery to how they did it that I saw it. Um, and a couple experts in helping me. One, a food scientist who could teach me how to make them shiny because there's a, a trick to that that people struggle with. And then the other person was somebody who, who makes strategies for a living. And, and he taught me how to do it with fruit, cereals, nuts, how to infuse flavors and crunchy textures in the drages and just kind of make it as appealing as possible. And that's going to be a good portion of my, my two chocolate brands that I'm creating this year. Yeah, you've seemed to stay right on the forefront of new developments in your area of expertise which you said previously was chocolate. So I want to know how has the chocolate industry evolved in the past few years? Well, of, I mean, thanks to the pandemic, um, I would say the pandemic has created um, a huge surge in entrepreneurship. And I think when the hotel and hospitality industry kind of collapsed under uh, the closure of uh, many businesses, a lot of the uh, cooks and rank and file cooks and sous chefs and chefs, in order to survive, they just started doing side gigs. And many of them had a bunch of time on their hands. And um, when you have a bunch of time on your hands, it's, it's really constructive to um, find new things to do. And uh, a lot of people um, went to work. They took online classes. I taught a bunch of online classes to people all over the world. I was flying to Buffalo, New York, where the uh, Sell Me Chocolate Equipment is sold. And um, we had people waking up at 4 a.m. in New Zealand and Australia to take a class with me. Or people uh, in Norway uh, attending at night um, just online for three and a half hours a day for three days straight. It was challenging, but it goes to show you that people, when they set their mind to something, they can really get it done. And um, they started out in small scale, and then people got used to shipping things in, and they wanted some 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 luxury and some comfort during the pandemic, especially when they were sheltering in place. And and people um, really, I saw a, a huge surge in how people order and eat. And um, and I, all over the internet, uh, I, I got more and more questions about how to get into it, what they should invest in uh, equipment-wise or in themselves. And uh, it really was incredible. But the one thing that I was disappointed in when I watch what's happening in the world of chocolate, especially here in the United States or Canada, I, I find that people are really getting away from making their chocolates with chocolate. It's everything but chocolate. They want to have fancy colored sprayed shells with either marshmallow or caramel or uh, pâte de fruit in them. And it's no longer chocolate. So, you know, my new concept of artisan chocolate focuses around single origin chocolate and it's very simple ganaches, simply coated. Uh, so you can taste the difference between Madagascar, a Peruvian grown cacao, a Venezuelan grown cacao, a Hawaiian grown cacao, or, or a cacao, a chocolate made uh, from the cacao that's grown in Vietnam. I even have a couple varieties made with wild cacao beans from Venezuela. So I've seen it go from you know, people who are really serious chocolatier to what I, I, I consider people making novelties. And I, and you don't see as much color on European chocolates, um, you know, artisan chocolates as you do here in the States or Canada or in Mexico. Um, and people, you know, there is that eye appeal with the color. But when I see somebody say, oh, look, it's peanut and strawberry pate of wheat, peanut butter and jelly. I don't know where the chocolate is in their chocolate. And they have chocolate shops and they should be focusing on chocolate, not on all these sugary sweets. So I'm trying to bring chocolate back. And the class I just taught was, you know, basically a seminar on how to utilize and really focus on bringing back pure chocolate to the chocolate industry. Now, you mentioned the Artisan brand of chocolate that you're developing. And I understand that you're also working on a casual snacking brand to capture a wider audience. Now, how will you bring that type of quality, that value for chocolate to both audiences? Well, there's two audiences. That's why I'm, I'm making two brands. And the other the reason why there's two, two brands is I, I never will wholesale the artisan brand. 
I will control all of that myself. I will give like bulk discounts for corporate orders because Christmas is huge. You know, here in Los Angeles, uh, most of the corporate orders for chocolate go to agencies. You know, the film industry is huge here, obviously. So it goes to the agencies and they buy so many gifts. And uh, in my previous incarnation of Beverly Hills, we were selling tens of thousands of pieces uh, a month to like Louis Vuitton and Tiffany and companies like that, that we are aligned with. Um, so that's obviously huge. But the other side of the industry uh, is the casual snacking line of chocolate, which is also massive. So just for the person that, you know, I think, I think we can live in the same, I think both parties can live in the same world. You know, I think um, it's okay to eat very, very fine chocolate and it's okay to eat novelty chocolate like M&M's. There's nothing wrong with it. If we did not have novelty chocolate, we wouldn't be able to appreciate really exquisite chocolate. So as a business person, uh, I, I want to fill the gap uh, where hotels and and um, cruise lines and other sectors of hospitality no longer have employees and skilled labor to create those things anymore and manufacture them. And I can step in and, and uh, create a, a flush of revenue for my company with a casual snacking line. So there'll be very long shelf life things. It won't be anything fancy. It'll be dragees, but it'll be like coated cereal dragees, malt balls, uh, a new line of malt balls, um, chocolate covered pretzels, chocolate covered Biscoff cookies. Nothing super fancy. The things that really run, ring the register. I mean, because as a as a chef, I'm a business person too, so I can be a creator um, with chocolate and sweets and that sort of thing. But at the same time, I'm not a charity, so I have to also think. Uh, with a business sense as well, because I do have uh, some investors and I need to protect their investment and, and offer them a return as well. And then hopefully own the entire project uh, within three years um, and myself. That's, that's the goal. What are some of the main challenges uh, currently facing the craft of chocolate making? I, I think I, I think it's it's been alleviated a little bit, but we I think we were all worried, everybody in the chocolate industry a few years ago about whether um, the historic cacao plantations around the world would still be maintained by the families that have run them for many, many years. You know, due to the fact that everybody in the world can now meet up with each other on social media, which is incredible, it's given us a brand new perspective on life. And one of the great things about what's happened to the chocolate industry and then primarily the cacao industry is Due to the competition, uh, the the cacao growers have received much better treatment than the old colonial um, model that was wor previously worked. So, for instance, France would go into Ivory Coast or some other country in Africa and take their cacao beans and pay them very little and not care whether they have basic resources such as clean water, feminine hygiene products. Um, you know, proper housing and that sort of thing. And and some of the people who have worked in these plantations said, you know, I'd rather just not do it anymore. I see this world outside of me. I, I, I don't want to do this anymore. There's not enough money in it. And then the other thing that's really pushed that is all the craft chocolate makers, which have cut into the market for the big guys. So the big companies go down and pay more money. They've become more ethical in their treatment of the um, plantation owners and the, and the and the farmers who work and pick and cure the cacao so we can all enjoy chocolate. And uh, it's really made it a better world uh, for all of us. And, 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 it's, and the big companies in Europe have gone into Latin America, they've gone into Africa, they've gone into Vietnam and places like that, uh, or into uh, the South Pacific, uh, Papua New Guinea and Indonesia, and they've helped grow and plant um, new uh, cacao trees and build water wells and schools and baseball fields and help provide with really simple things that were missing in their lives so they can have some leisure time with their families and really understand there's an importance to having good, healthy relationships with their employees. And their employees are not just the ones in their plants in, in, in Europe making the chocolate, it's the employees that are part of their extended, extended families in those countries that are actually growing it. So what would the chocolate industry be like in the near future? Uh, if you would were to design the chocolate industry, what would that look like for you? Well, one that 
Um, you know, I, I, well, for me, I always tell people, and this is, and it's topical because I just had this conversation with the group that I was teaching over the last three days and that I, I just tell people just to keep it simple with chocolate. I mean, chocolate is, is the one flavor that almost every person on the planet can agree on. And that is what makes chocolate so beautifully unique is that not everything that we, that we travel to see and see how they're eating is something we like in our culture. So, you know, I travel all around the world. So and I've been to Sweden and Denmark and France. And I was just, I just got back from France and Belgium and my wife and I were eating at a restaurant our first night in Antwerp and the gentleman next to us was eating horse meat. And that's not something you see in America. And even though my wife's a carnivore and I'm not, she was like, no, I, I can't do it. You know, it's because she's not part of that culture. She doesn't really understand it. And then my wife is also, you know, from Vietnam. So her family eats very differently than the rest of America. And just because, uh, you know, they eat something really unique to them, say like balut, which is, you know, a duck egg that's kind of in half stage of growth. Um, you know, her, her family has no issue eating that. Other people would balk at that idea. But chocolate is one of those things that every culture loves, no matter what your religion is or what your skin color is or what your beliefs are almost everybody on the planet loves chocolate. So I, I tell people, just keep it simple. You don't have to make it levitate. You don't have to combine it with weird ingredients. You know, make it that classic look, that classic taste. People already want to give you money for it. Do not make it challenging for them. Don't screw it up. It already tastes good. There's a lot of magic that happens in the fermentation of it, the roasting of it, the blending of the beans. And finally, you're given this great product to work with you know, keep it simple, stick to the integrity, make it taste like chocolate, be passionate about it, and uh, your your employees will appreciate it and so will your guests. Yeah, as you mentioned, you, you have been traveling a lot and teaching classes to students uh, from all over the world. Uh, how did you get into teaching? Well, the internet, you know, the internet found me and made me an expert. Uh, they loved, the, you know, I didn't really understand the power of, of social media when I joined Instagram. And I had no idea what it would do for people. I just didn't know what it was. I thought it was like some photo app that you had on your phone. I didn't realize the worldwide reach. And, um, you know, in in the probably 2015, I created a video cutting a sugar candy. It was a patafui with raspberry and chocolate. And that video just blew up. It became the most viewed video in the history of Instagram. Uh, it was getting 700,000 views a day. Um, and I think uh, the final views uh, it, it were 347,890,000 3, views and over 140,000 likes. So um, it really changed my world. My, my following grew considerably um, and all the media attention. Um, swooped in. Uh, I'm walking. I'm driving around, meeting agencies with uh, television producers and movie producers, and I was going to Netflix and Lifetime Network, and 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 I remember telling somebody, uh, I said, "Well, I got to monetize this thing because this is where it's important, you know." And I didn't really know how to do it, and um, and then people started taking all these master classes around the world, and as I got better at what I do, um, not knowing, I have this, I was just practicing becoming a better chef because I wanted to be a better chef. That was just me. Uh, I didn't realize how many other people would appreciate it. And when you, when you meet the students that you teach, you do see little bits and pieces of yourself and everybody, you know? So it's, it's one of the things that I've learned to, as I've become a better teacher is that the people that you're teaching you, you, I have been at one point or another in my career. So I, I, I listen to every one of their struggles and I can, uh, can relate to them uh, individually. And that's kind of helped me as a teacher. So getting the invitations to go to Spain, to go to Sweden, you know, I always tell people that I never know what's around the corner, but somebody is coming up with something um, and eventually they approach me with it. I get off the airplane yesterday in Los Angeles there's an email from a chef in Germany inviting me to a, to a very uh, prestigious culinary school that is laid out with incredible equipment, 
Um, and he's offered me an opportunity to teach in front of his students, not hands-on, just demonstrate for two or three days how to make colored bonbons, coated bonbons, the interiors and all the techniques, a real intensive demonstration. So those, those are the things that kind of come along. You know, I've had invitations to go um, to, uh, I'm working on invitations to go do something in um, uh, Portugal right now. So um, wherever it, it makes sense, um, you know, I, I really enjoy doing it because it's a chance to meet other people and gain experiences. And, and I, listen, when I got, when I became a chef, I had no plans on doing this. This is not what I thought I would do. I thought I would just work in a kitchen until I died. But the, the zeitgeist has changed and I'm able, and all chefs should understand this now. Well, they are creators. And when you're the creator, you have the power. You have the power to write your own checks and you have the power to do your own thing. And the internet has given us that power to reach out and talk to people all over the world to create a bond with them and to really understand them. You know, I'm 53 years old. I grew up in the Cold War era. And really, as an example of where the internet has taken uh, this industry, Christmas Day in 2018, there is some lady sends me a direct message on Instagram, a photograph. She's holding up a box of my chocolates in the bag in Red Square, in Moscow. And I thought, wow, how incredible is that? I asked her, I said, well, how did you get them? And she said, well, my daughter goes to school in Harvard. Uh, I said, before you come back to Russia, go to Los Angeles, get us chocolates and bring them back. I want to try them. That's the power of the influence that we have as creators now. That it means that's, so much that's to incredible. people. <laughs> it is incredible. And we don't, I didn't ship them to Russia. I didn't ship them to yeah. Australia. I didn't ship them to Norway. But when you do something that people want, it makes sense. And I'm a small creator. You know, I have, I'm not Mercedes Benz. I'm not Pablo Picasso, where people work over, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars. But it does mean a lot to people. And the art we do is ephemeral. So, you know, we have to squeeze a lot of flavor into something so small so they can enjoy it in such a short period of time. Well, let me bring up uh, another industry that you've worked with, I think, closer to home there. You've been a consultant to the cannabis industry, which has produced some high quality consumer products where you are in California. What makes chocolate such an ideal medium for working with cannabis? Well, it's not just... Well, it makes it taste better, that's for sure, because the cannabis stuff tastes terrible. If you have ever eaten cannabis oil, it tastes terrible. The chocolate's a very strong flavor, so it really can kind of dominate the bitterness of the, the cannabis oil. And again, it's, it's a really appealing flavor. So one of the changes in the California cannabis market, and I, I haven't really been around the country to see too much. I've been to uh, Northern California just recently, um, but... I've been to Oregon and I've been to Washington where cannabis is legal for recreation and New Jersey uh, as recently as last fall um, where they're just kind of getting started on that. And there's really nothing in New York state, even though it's legal recreationally, they just haven't gotten, gotten it launched. Um, You know, 10 years ago, it was still stuff in a brown paper bag that seemed very homemade. And then a lot of money came into it. They saw this opportunity to take it to a new level. And the stores that sell cannabis um, edibles all of a sudden look like high-end boutiques where you would, might buy a cell phone or an iPad or a laptop. They look, like, they look like Apple stores. And that was the model. So the, cons- the consumer has really changed. So the people that are, are spending money on um, cannabis edibles now um, – are people in their mid to uh, uh, mid thirties, all the way up until their fifties and sixties. So a lot of the the cannabis edibles are are basically comparable to. I always tell the clients I work with, I said, don't make it so far out of reach of what the target audience grew up eating. So you know, in my age group, I grew up eating Snickers and Reese's peanut butter cup and that sort of thing. So that's not really the huge crowd that's using the edibles as much as it's the crowd that's in the thirties. So they want their things to be a little bit more tart. So they like flavors like yuzu, passion fruit, sudashi, sure. you know, raspberry, that sort yeah. of thing, things that they grew up eating that are, they're familiar with. So a lot of the cannabis edibles wind up looking like things they 
they grew up conventionally eating. So that's kind of the interesting thing with it. So in the time we have remaining, which is just a, a couple minutes, if you had one piece of advice for people who want to improve their chocolate skills, but they are afraid to, what would you say to them? Don't be afraid. Fear is what inhibits all of us. If, if, if fear will stop every one of us. And, and I know when I was just teaching in Buffalo, you know, I, I told that audience as they're, as they're working with me, I bring them up and they work with me in front of everybody else. And I said, you know, I know I'm pushing you into your fear zone. I get it. I totally get it. I said, but this is not life or death. This, this is just chocolate. So you don't, you don't have to take it too seriously. If, if we make an error, we can fix it. That's how we get better. So don't be afraid. It can, it can be tossed out. It's not life or death. You know, we're not, we're not going to war. We're not performing a surgery. We're not, you know, driving real fast on a snowy road. These are things that, you know, can really be harmful if you do it, if you do them incorrectly, if you have a bad day, if you're not focused, this is just chocolate and we can learn from those mistakes. So it's, it's, I tell people just to, be, you know, think critically, um, just kind of accept responsibility for the mistake. Let's figure out how it's, how we can repair it. And if it's something that needs to be radically changed, we will change it radically. If something that needs to be just kind of tweaked, we'll just tweak it. All right. On that note, I think we'll end it here. Thank you very much for joining us for coffee today, Chris Harvey. It's been a pleasure to get to know a little bit more about you and what you do. Thanks so uh, much. It's been my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. If you like this episode, don't miss an episode by becoming a member. We're waiting for you each week with more guests. We're on all podcast platforms. Just search for Coffee with Schoolinary. We're also waiting for you at our website and on our social networks, where you can get to know all our courses and teachers. 